My name is Tim Jakes, and I am uh, the, the global head of special interest groups. Um, and um, I have the privilege of, of um, taking you through today. So this is a really fun, fun experience. What this is part of is the Project Success webinar series. This is a, an ongoing webinar series that looks at project management in many different perspectives. Um, we, we look at everything from uh, sustainability and ecology to mega projects to smart cities. So, um, and today we're looking at the implications of artificial intelligence in our society. So, um, so this is all under the umbrella of the IPMA uh, special interest groups. So you, uh, I think some of you have seen the chat already. Please feel free to use the chat, uh, and we will we will do that. So for those of you who may not be familiar, special interest groups are an exploration of um, different parts of our world that may benefit your career, your work, uh, the planet. Um, so our SIG members strive to advance their industry. They create new standards and network. Uh, with industry leaders and peers um, and find opportunities for growth. So that's what we're all about. We are in a constant state of um, growth and development and uh, we, we are never arrived at our destination. We are always in transit in the special interest groups, searching for um, different approaches, new techniques, what's, what's happening in project management that will help um, advance, better solutions, better thinking, more engaged stakeholders, all of that. Um, so it's, it's really wonderful to, um, to be a part of that. Special interest groups cover a number of different areas. Uh, today we have seven of them. Uh, artificial intelligence, of course, uh, is one. Healthcare, out of Brazil, artificial intelligence is, is comes from uh, our our Turkish member association. Healthcare uh, comes from our Brazilian member association. Innovation and change is uh, out of the USA. Smarter University is uh, from our good friend uh, Vinyamin Kasiv out of uh, Russia. Uh, Mega Projects comes directly from the UK uh, with Julian Denicol, Professor Julian Denicol. Uh, we have Smarter Cities, which comes to us out of the South African Member Association. And of course, Smarter Rural, um, which is direct out of Spain and Mexico. Um, and so we had, together we've got this wonderful collection of thought leaders who, um, who are cultivating networks and bringing people together in conversation about these different topics as it relates to project management. It's really exciting. And we have more special interest groups in development. So we are always looking at, at uh, what's relevant today and what, what more can we bring to the forefront. So it is my pleasure now um, to introduce to you uh, Atso Momchilovich. Atso is the co-director and co-founder at the Global AI Ethics Institute. Atso is also a, uh, an entrepreneur, owner of Future HR. Um, so that is a company that, that looks at um, uh, building new works for their clients in mission and vision and branding and organizational design in recruitment and education. Um, Atso, as one of his uh, projects, is looking at national AI capital. And so this, this presentation today is based on a series of articles in Medium, uh, which I hope you'll share the link to, Atso. Um, and so today we'll hear from Atso on national AI capital, great differentiator or great equalizer. So without further ado, Atso, let me turn this over to you. Well, thanks, Tim, for the nice introduction. Your pronunciation was perfect. Like, really, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm really satisfied and happy. 
So yeah. I hope that I successfully shared my screen. You did. And I'm going to speak in, in the next 25 to 30 minutes about this project that, that I'm working on for almost a year now. Uh, looking at your subgroups, uh, I can hope that it goes from the artificial intelligence subgroup to the mega project subgroup in a, in a few years. So maybe uh, then, then it will be interesting to give a follow up if the project succeeds. So what is the national AI capital? Well, let me start the story like this. So I was thinking, what, what are we talking about in the, in the business circle and in the society in general? So what are the differences that, that are interesting in the last few years or maybe even in a decade or more? So basically what crossed my mind is basically many differences that are interesting. Some of them are, for example, individual. So we can monitor when we are speaking uh, and comparing globally about distribution of wealth. You know, how many top percenters are having what chunk of wealth uh, in, in some countries. So the, there are famous uh, clips uh, on YouTube that, you know, like the, the, the gap is, is becoming larger, I would say. So then you can, you can see that the countries uh, that are having really... Uh, great amount of wealth, but then very interesting distribution between the first and 1% and the last 20%. But then on the other hand, you can, you can monitor the differences on the national level. So for example, you can monitor the, the size of the economies. So in this report, you can see like, okay, we have the United States, we have the China that is emerging and, and closing by and all the predictions that are going to happen there. So what is interesting here in this and in some other uh, 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 comparisons is what are what is the size of the difference so what was for me maybe even more important and interesting was the comparison of the digital readiness for example so you can see that the top countries and and the bottom countries they're having a different score but the difference is like maybe 20 percent 50 percent 100 percent 200 percent depending on the methodology uh, one very promising and interesting slide for me also is to check the innovation capacity of a country. So you have big countries that are not that innovative and you have some very small countries uh, like Croatia, for example, where I come from, that could be very innovative. So it's not connected with their size, with, with their approach and with some other tools and, and capabilities that they have. So basically for me, uh, it was important to, gets to this point so the human capital this is something that could be underlying factor in many differences that we are observing today and we have uh, from world economic forum uh, also very interesting methodology that is comparing and you can see the top countries usually the western countries and you have those at the bottom mostly african countries and they're giving a certain kind of profile and the taste of the capability of a country based on the human capital, on the number and education, more or less, of their people. So my question, the big question for me was, what will be the biggest factor that will create the future differences possibly? The, the flip side of the question uh, is, what could be the factor that could equalize all the countries, that can bring them all to the, to the, higher, to the higher levels? And the question and the answer to that question that I proposed and discussed and, and kind of elaborated and researched was national AI capital. And I will give you, of course, uh, the definition which I fine-tuned uh, on the way. But before starting uh, this project, and I also kind of approached it really on the project base, my first phase was to see, okay, is anybody thinking the same way as I am? The first question and the second question, is this a good idea? What would other experts say? Maybe I'm just, you know, like having something that sounds great to me, but basically it's stupid. <laughs> so to answer the first question, I was searching a little bit for the global reports. Who makes them? What kind of reports and, and, and why? So it was easy to find the reports on the artificial intelligence uh, and their estimations from, I don't know, many famous companies. You can see here McKinsey and Company. You can see uh, Boston Consulting Group thinking about the rise of AI. 
Uh, you can see the Bain also consulting company that is famous again with the different reports on the artificial intelligence. And then the usual suspects like uh, Ernst & Young, uh, global uh, review about the future, uh, Deloitte, of course, tech trends, that, and all of them are having projects that I that are more or less uh, going on a yearly basis, so they're updated uh, frequently. And then, then well, there is the KPMG with their technology insiders. Uh, and for me, th this was enough to conclude that basically, yeah, the AI could be the technology that is coming. The hype cycle, which is kind of slowly developing uh, in the last decades, I mean comparing to the few decades before much faster, but still probably I think that we are here at the beginning of this of this uh, wave of, of, of hyper cycle. So basically then I defined, and I'll show you uh, in, in which way the national AI capital. So this is the fine tuned definition after my research. So national AI capital is the capacity of a country to ethically develop and apply artificial intelligence and, and cope with different challenges uh, and opportunities of various AI matters and its transformational impact. So in what, what is the reason? In order to increase the country's or citizens' social and economic well-being and national competitiveness, which is a very important part, in a sustainable manner. So it has a few uh, uh, important parts this definition and this is because i took uh, under consideration many good advices that i gathered from all around the world so basically the answer to my second question is this a good idea or not i said okay let's let's check it so during the last summer i started the the mini project of the something that i'm calling the national uh, the initial global survey and i gathered answers from 200 plus ai experts from all around the world so basically 56 countries and i asked them a number of questions i'm going to share uh, some of them uh, and some of the answers right now so basically this is the country and response to say okay we had many from europe but we had africa asia south and north north america all together around uh, 12 percent so i think it was uh, reasonably representative so also what was interesting for me is what is the involvement uh, of those people in the AI, AI, ai sector because i wanted to to have the broad uh, uh, and diversified portfolio of people that are answering those questions in order to get more experience. So 30% of them were owners of the AI companies or employees, 26% uh, researchers, academics, professors from the universities, 24% uh, developers, engineers, and we had also some AI enthusiasts and uh, startup members who are in the artificial intelligence projects. Uh, also, what is interesting is that they were a highly educated group of people, so 28% with a PhD, 34% uh, with masters, and 12%, for example, with MBAs. So basically, uh, no uh, responders with, with low education. And this was, this was the key question uh, for me, the first key question for me to, to get the answer. Is it important to consider the AI capacity uh, which I defined in the survey on the national level. And this confirmed to me that like, yes, almost 90% of them told me, yes, this is like really very important, important thing to consider. How the countries are going to tackle this problem? What is going to happen if we, uh, if we don't do what is necessary to advance uh, our AI projects and, and to have better chances in the globalized world? The, the second uh, also very interesting question is, Will countries differ in their, in their AI capital? And even more importantly, through the answers, in what period of time? So basically, how much time do you think that we have? So 37% of them said, uh, yes, there are going to be differences and they are coming and they are going to be visible in a short term period. Additional 50% said, yes, we will have significant differences and most likely in the midterm period. So it was like short term three to five years, midterm, let's say five maybe five to ten years so also uh something to be aware of and there are a lot of discussions on that second so who is going to create the ai capital of the country and who is responsible for it so the obvious answers 77 percent was the private companies 
or corporations. There was uh, increasingly and surprisingly high level of uh, trust in the startups, which emerged as a second, and then the universities like academia, 59%. And only 31% relied on the government and government uh, institutions. And this is like really interesting topic itself to discuss this question. Also, I asked them a few other questions. Some of them was, uh, where will countries invest most and the fastest? So it was like uh, healthcare, security, and finance. And on the bottom, you can see education. And it was interesting to combine with the second connected question, where should countries invest most and fastest? And then you have the healthcare on the first place, and you have education uh, on the second place. So we have the, this, uh, this gap between what is going to be done because of the profit, probably, and what should be done because of the because of the society. So then, after this survey, I gathered a lot of data and process them, and I fine-tuned the methodology. Uh, it has five dimensions with uh, 15 factors all, all together. So the factors are uh, the human capital talent dimension, uh, government and the politics dimension, private sector dimension, academic research dimension, and some specific uh, additional uh, factors that can influence overall overall score. So at the end of the uh, of, of this uh, project, I should have the ranking of, of all the countries in the world and their profile, which is a good grounds and basis for the future consulting, future development, and future actions that can help. Uh, all of the countries around the world that are not those nine countries who are currently de developing most of the AI to kind of to get in, in, in the train, I would say. So obviously, uh, I was checking what skills I'm going to need from the project management perspective. And I mean, there are many skills and, and I researched a lot of them, but I kind of picked the two of them. So basically, uh, one that I can see now that really is going to be important is working with and managing remote teams because this is global projects i'm having contact with, with people from all around the world from every continent basically uh so this is something that yeah i i became aware that i need to develop more uh, uh in when bu building my own capacity and the second thing which is also kind of obvious, but it is mentioned and it is mentioned uh, in some articles directly as a project management skill is the data science expertise. So I'm going to gather and already did gather a lot of data that needs to be processed, uh, interpreted, uh, uh, visualized. So this is also something that I, I'm taking uh, very seriously either to develop uh, uh, myself or to, to have the members of the team who are specialists in this part. So I was also then uh, kind of tr trying to predict what I need to be aware of and what is uh, happening in the modern project management uh, in, in the projects, let's say. So there are also a few things that I kind of directly felt. So there is that uh, complex uh, uh, and unknown technical situation because I have many variables that are not known at the moment uh, and some consequences, of course. The second thing is, also complex and unknown geopolitical and sociopolitical situations, which again, I'm directly having when trying to, uh, to run this, this project because uh, it is connected also uh, with the governments of, of the different countries and with their uh, political situation. So definitely increasingly complex regulation and governments is something that it is going to significantly influence uh, uh, the pace and some decisions in this uh, project. So I was also monitoring uh, and, and trying to uh, be ahead of, uh, of the time. So to kind of to be aware of trends. So there are some nice articles. I can send it, uh, send the link to those who are interested. Just contact me on LinkedIn or somewhere. So what are the trends? Uh, and then you can see some trends that are directly connected with, with my project. So increasingly, as you can see on the first one, the projects will be impacted by artificial and detailed intelligence today. So I said it like, yes, checked. This is exactly the trend that I can feel. So the project managers will need broader skills or in from AI to EI, EI, EI uh, as in uh, emotional intelligence. <laughs> and then embracing the hybrid project management approaches, 
and uh, teams were becoming increasingly diverse. So this is exactly what, what uh, was happening to me, and you will see it in the last few slides uh, uh, regarding some groups and, and some results that, uh, that I already kind of joined. So the first six months uh, I was uh, of the project, I was happy to be present and called to give the lectures and present the results on the five conferences to uh, publish 10 articles in, a, in a three countries, basically re regionally, to from the beginning have eight different partners. Now the number is, is bigger. This is like in the first six months. And some, some uh, scientific papers that are going to be prepared and published, hopefully in tier one uh, journals. So this is like the press clipping uh, that I collected in, in the few months and I was quite, quite, uh, happy that also this part of my project that I planned was uh, was successful. I was in general trying to partner with and plan the partnership with AI associations, with universities and research centers, with corporations and companies which could be uh, interested in investing and supporting this project. And then again with government institutions. All of them can find me on my LinkedIn and some of you already did. I'm very glad that uh, that we are connected. And you can read more details about the, the survey that uh, that I just presented you on my Medium. I have I have it there, uh, I think, on, in a few articles uh, so far. Also, I created, cr created one small project for the students so they could choose between researching economic indicators or uh, gathering the data for the factors that I'm having or just uh, discovering and describing job roles and job descriptions in artificial intelligence uh, area. So I'm currently negotiating partnership with a few companies and I have certain uh, type of companies that I want to uh, collaborate with, uh, but this is just for you to have the, the oversight that this is also kind of part of my project that planning and future budgeting of the expenses. In Croatia, uh, I've partnered with five universities and I cooperated with their professors and students. Uh, and on the national level, I also have, also has a partners, uh, some technological institutes, the Croatian AI Association. But what was consequence of this project is that it kind of branched. I got uh, connected with different people, as I mentioned, uh, from all around the world. And they also, because of their interest, invited me to join uh, some of their projects or even to start some projects uh, uh, with them. So uh, as you can see on my like official title for this presentation, I'm the uh, co-founder and co-director of Global AI Ethics Institute, which is established in Paris. The, the first co-founder is uh, my partner, Emmanuel uh, Goffi, that he was the director of the uh, Sapiens, Sapiens uh, Institute, also in France, the Observatory for the Artificial Intelligence. Uh, with the Institute, we also kind of partner with three additional organizations that are in the broader segment of artificial intelligence, and we created Alliance for Responsible AI that is handling not only the ethics part, which we are going to and we specialize, but also some other parts and angles. And also uh, some of the members of Alliance for Responsible AI and some uh, people from the, our, let's say, bigger community uh, were invited to also get included and to involve themselves in, uh, it is called the International Group of Artificial Intelligence that is in the Middle East, in Bahrain, established and also gathering people from all around the world that are working on a different uh, segments of artificial intelligence. So this is more or less the current status of my product. A project. It's going to be very interesting summer. I need to collect a lot more data to find even more partners to get connected on different countries and continents. And yeah, maybe even hopefully during during the uh, summer to find some companies that are going to see the mutual benefit of creating that kind of let's say report and methodology. Uh, for the mutual benefit. So, respecting the uh, the time frame, it's a few minutes before uh, two thirty. So, I will finish my presentation here. There are many other uh, detailed segments from from the research and many other aspects. But if some of you are interested, I will be happy to uh, share them those information with you, and of course, to to discuss and to answer all the questions that you might have. So 
thank you very much for your attention. Great. And back to you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Well, please, um, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A and we'll, we'll speak to those right away. Um, so I have some questions for you, Otso. So um, this concept of the national AI um, sort of uh, intelligence, uh, right? This, that it's divided up by country. Why? With so much work happening internationally and certainly uh, code can be transported very easily across uh, boundaries. Why look at this from a national perspective? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is an interesting question, which is partially touched in this question, who is responsible for the development of AI? So basically, when, when you look at the past, you know, if we, if we consider those things that are called like the uh, general purpose technologies, you know, and they're kind of influencing then the whole world, a lot of them and, and, and many big discoveries are those who, are, who happened primarily in some country. You know, it was either it was even funded by the government or the fundamental research that that uh, was the basis for, for uh, some technologies was inside certain country. So basically, this is also kind of the political question. But uh, I think that countries need to be uh, aware that uh, some of those projects and some of the knowledge needs to be in the country uh, because what could happen is that we are going just to have large corporations that are uh, developing something and then the countries are just the users of it and they, they, they cannot control it. So in, yeah. some, in some segments, this is completely fine. And we are doing it in, with many other technologies, but within some parts, like for example, the defense, uh, you cannot have some product that, that is developed by you know, some other entity. You need to be completely sure that that you develop it that is like uh, very secure, you know. So a lot of questions similar to that are going to be like, okay, in the country, are you going to develop it? Are you maybe not even to develop it, but what countries can develop is the, uh, the capacity to apply them, you know, because it is not only the development, but countries, if they want to get uh, uh, on this trend of artificial intelligence, it's not only like to, to educate and to have the developers, you need to have the legal framework that, that is allowing that, you know, you need to have the political, political will, you know, that is going to allow you to say, okay, let's, let's be modern, let's use the tools, because uh, what could happen, the worst case scenario, you'll have some countries that are applying artificial intelligence uh, and have more, let's say, willingness, willingness to do it, and those countries are going to be like, not two or three times better, but like 50 times better, 100 times more productive than, than those like, less 20% of the countries which are completely ignoring the artificial intelligence. So then it is becoming, I would say, also a, a, a political question. Yeah, and so, so yeah, it is very political, right? And, and there are business segments that are using AI now, right? There are certainly many companies out there that are driving their, their products and services through AI, I think of in the US, I think of a company like Stitch Fix, right? Mm -hmm. Stitch Fix is where, as a company where they will mail you your clothing, uh, you, you get a subscription essentially for clothing and they will just yeah. mail it to you yeah. every month. Yeah, and they do this through, um, based on a whole AI algorithm that matches not only your preferences, but matches their supply chain to your, to your yeah. preferences. Um, so, so in that sense, there are these business uses for AI, and then there are civilian government uses for AI, and then, of course, defense uses for AI mm -hmm. um, that, that probably have the highest national security risk. Yeah? Yeah, it's true. It's true. What was my, my concern is, is to have the, these pictures. So, for example, when you go to Sri Lanka, you will see that, like, million people in Sri Lanka are employed with just picking the tea leaves. You know, this is like their job. So this is like the lowest uh, technical kind of job that you can have, you know. So you can basically choose. Are you going to uh, educate uh, your uh, citizens, 
in modern technologies and give them tools to be much more productive or you're just going to give them like do some manual work which is going to be replaced by by machines in probably next decade or something like that. Yeah. So the, the the countries, I think that the problem is that countries are not aware of that danger because that danger is coming much faster than we think. And thus the question uh, for the, the experts, how, how much time do you think that we have? And, and it's like, for many of them, it's like three to five years. And in, in the political life of a country, it's like nothing. It's basically maybe one change of a government, something like that. So they're not going to respond to this, to this, let's say, opportunity or threat, however, however you see it. And we need them to do because uh, I, I remember one good quote from one speaker on one conference. He said, uh, if regarding the artificial intelligence if you don't act act now you don't have a future you know yeah. and this is something that i think is 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 uh, completely forgotten on the national level huh yeah yeah you know and these these national policies are so important because they create this ecosystem this legal framework and they they yeah. vary differently right by country by the political makeup and the structure of the government but yeah. it's, it's very very important uh, yes yeah, more it, 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 it's on the national level but even in the supranational level so for example you can now check what what has been done on the level of Europe so Europe has now one proposed one act that is kind of defining uh, artificial intelligence project. So it is it is kind of conservative, let's say. It is respecting and aiming to have the responsible AI and kind of to assess the risks of the artificial intelligence uh, uh, projects, which in general is good. But what is interesting, then when you compare it to other parts of the world, United States doesn't have something like that. So basically startups who are developing their artificial intelligence in United States are going to have much less problems uh, than those in, in Europe, you know, the first thing. The second thing, you have the China, which is completely ignorant to many of those, like, let's say, values that we are having and trying to, to promote while developing uh, a technological products. So it's going to be uh, very interesting to see the frictions that are going to happen uh, globally uh, be, because of the different approaches o o on how to develop artificial intelligence and the adoption of people you know when you're going to buy certain product are you going to have more trust um, in european product or in uh, u.s product or in chinese product you know so it's yeah. going to be from yeah. the consumer perspective very very interesting and in that part you can also uh, see and then connect this ethical perspective, which I didn't mention in, in my uh, in my project and presentation, but is also very interesting. So I know here in the USA and and uh, uh, Ilya and and Mohammed, let me get to your questions here. But but let me just say, in the US, just yesterday, our Congress passed a bill that was a bipartisan bill, which today never happens in the US. Right? We have. <laughs> Such great war. <laughs> it was not filibustered, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this one was passed. It's called the Innovation and Competition Act. And it's essentially designed to be more competitive with China. So you can see in this sense that there are these uh, AI, and a lot of it is investment in technology, yeah. artificial intelligence, supporting a, a, an economy that is driven by new technology. So you can see how these things can become uh, maybe weaponized is not quite the right word, but yeah, you know, they, they become the, the, the thing by which uh, countries interact with each yeah. other. I think it's a great example because this is exactly what's going to happen. And this is exactly the question that all of us need to ask ourselves, is my company or my country or my continent, are we competitive enough? And what is the consequence of not being competitive enough? What is going to happen? Because like I said, all of those general purpose technologies, they're uh, great enablers, but also differentiators. Imagine now today having country without electricity. What would that mean for that country? And we are currently at the stage that, yeah, in 10 years, you could have countries without artificial intelligence, for example, or with low level of adoption of artificial intelligence projects. And then somebody needs to also think about, okay, 
what are the consequences for us living in that kind of country, you know, and there are like broad uh, and, and, and significant social uh, consequences, I, I, I assume. So let me um, follow up here. So a question from um, Mohammed uh, Mahoud uh, from Iran. Amazing presentation, loads of thanks, dear Atso. How does AI play a part in PM exactly? Is it just combining project agility and AI powered solutions enables PMs uh, to uh, to process, process complex project data in seconds and uncover patterns that may affect project delivery. Is that sort of the use case that you see or are there other use cases? Yeah, I, I must say that I'm answering uh, this question as a non-expert in artificial intelligence in project management. I can just answer from my, uh, let's say, general knowledge of artificial intelligence. And I think that the answer is more or less there. Probably the artificial intelligence projects are going to bring much more data to the project managers, you know, and allow them to find better some patterns and to make some predictions that were not that obvious uh, before. But then again, we return to this only for those project managers who are going to be educated to use those tools. This is the, the, the critical part. From what I was observing in the last few years, uh, uh, you have all this like big data and internet of things, which is allowing you to get uh, incredible information from the, let's say, production facilities, from the machines to predict uh, uh, when they are going to break, when they are going to uh, need some kind of refreshment, when they are going to order at the perfect time some new resources, something like that. So it's going, on one hand, it's going to allow and enable project managers to, uh, to have much better and more precise data, but then they should be very careful to choose the, uh, the smart data. That, and, and to go through all of those, let's say, uh, woods of, of, of data that is going to be thrown uh, and, at them. On the other hand, what, uh, what is also, well, in my experience and when I was speaking with my friends who are project managers, a lot of the work only come down, down surprisingly to the people, right? So like a big part of project management is communication. It's the, it's the soft skills. So basically the artificial intelligence is also going to give uh, you more data about people who are involved, who are engaged, who are providing some results. So it, it will kind of help them to steer the project in a better way and maybe even to, let's say, kind of to manage it, to manage people uh, inside of the project uh, better. So I think that like in, 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 in every other segment, there are going to be enormous possibilities for the project managers to, to level up their game with the artificial intelligence tools. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah, you know, it, it strikes me that um, projects, projects in this realm are, are going to become more complex, are going to become uh, more uh, differentiated, right? You will see non-AI powered and, pow and AI powered projects. And there's such a gap between the knowledge that one needs to be um, an expert in AI or to even be operational. The, the math alone is, is very, very daunting. Um, mm -hmm. And so for a generalist, for a general project manager or even a technically oriented project manager, mm -hmm. I wonder how that, that gap gets bridged. How do you begin to work within that environment if you don't have those, that deep knowledge? Yeah, well, well I, would, uh, I would be, or, or let's say, cautiously optimistic about this part because uh, I, I think that we need to differentiate two things. So basically at a certain level of maturity, we are going to have, yes, all of those things that you mentioned and expertise uh, required for people who are developing the AI and AI products. But on the other hand, the project managers, the human resource managers, the many others, they're just going to use it as a tool, you know, if, if I'm looking at my computer now, yeah, I mean, I don't know basically anything about how the electrons in the processor are functioning exactly, but I'm using the tool. So basically, uh, all of us others, uh, we are going to, to get the tool and we need to learn how to use the tool the same way that you're using the car or the software or the, I don't know, some kind of SAP software, right? So it could be, it could be a little bit easier than it seems at the moment. 
So question from Ilya, any thoughts on upcoming artificial general intelligence, AGI ownership and the impact on wider society? Yeah, it's a tough one. So uh, uh, I, I'm a little bit skeptical that we are going to achieve AGI in any time soon. From what I'm reading and observing from the experts, I think that we are kind of far away from it. You know, we, we are not there yet. But on, on the other hand, I, I must say that, and I can recommend the, the, the book Singularity from the Ray Kurzweil, right? I, very interesting. I, I'm lucky to have one signed copy of this book at my home. Wow. <laughs> By him, yeah, I got it from the United States, some strange channels. Uh, and I mean, it would be amazing to have in 2042 uh, something close to AGI and then to have this like exponential jump, which we cannot predict. I mean, the impact of, of, on a wider society, I can only say we really don't know. It's like completely unimaginable. Are we going to be like wiped out or, 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 or kind of transferred to the computers and some kind of memory? I really don't know. I, I'm afraid or or maybe I'm satisfied that it might not happen as soon as we think, you know, because reading the, some kind of uh, uh, reports and, and, and articles from the experts, I think that we have a long way to go. Uh, but on the other side, uh, and we are doing right now a lot of interesting things with specialized artificial intelligence. And I think it's going to take us another decade to make significant improvements to ourselves, to the societies, to the jobs, to the products that we're developing and, and to, to our countries. Oh, great. So question for you, what's next for your work? What's next? You know, you've got the survey, uh, you've got the survey results and data. Where, where do you go next from here? So uh, because of this survey and the very encouraging results, uh, it, it was kind of aligned and uh, with my some other wishes. So basically, I started my PhD. So I am in the now in the first third of my uh, PhD, which I'm doing on in digital economy. And then, of course, I'm going to do the the thesis is going to be connected with artificial intelligence and national AI projects. So I'm going to kind of uh, uh, develop it on even deeper level. Uh, I'm also, as you can see, in the process of, of uh, gathering a lot of people who are partnering with me and I'm partnering with them on the artificial intelligence project, like the AI Ethics Institute, the uh, uh, Responsible AI Alliance, the, uh, the, the global group and stuff like that. So basically the, the, the network is already being established. And the third part I started uh, and I'm having communication with a few consulting companies that are, uh, let's say, present internationally, like at least 80 countries in the world, who can say, okay, we want to be part of AI story and AI discovery story. We can use it uh, as our PR, as our marketing, uh, to deepen our specialty, and we want to kind of to invest in it. So I'm, the, 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 in the next year or a half of the year, hope, hopefully, I will find some partners, some investors, and uh, I'm going to be able then to maybe even hire a few more people that are going to collect all of this enormous amount of data, process it, and then structure it uh, in some way that, that it makes sense to, to be able to get to the final product. And that is the, the, the ranking of the countries and their profile, because then you can come to any government in the world and look, you're here like your neighbors are here or here, are, do you want to be better? Let's talk how we can, uh, how can we, uh, how can we make it better? Or maybe on the level of the companies also to kind yeah, of share what, that what part. Are the factors, you know, yeah, that, that would be a very interesting discussion. You know, what are the, the cultural factors, the human factors? What are the, yeah. the infrastructure factors that yeah. would build yeah. that, that economy, that national capital, yeah. Exactly. Those, and the, the, the methodology is here to gather some data, but also to ask the right questions, as you just did, you know, like to, to, to make all of those things uh, uh, in the head and to be aware of, uh, of the people who are deciding. Like, do you have an answer for that? Are you even asking these questions? What do we need to do to be better? What we are having and what we need to have in the future? 